Welcome to Lecture 17 of BIB 201, Bible Doctrines 1. Today's lecture is going to be continuing through the section on God's moral attributes and then beginning a new section on the names of God. So let's get started. Picking back up where we left off in Lecture 17, we're on God's moral attribute or His communicable attribute of holiness. Now we've already discussed that the definition of holiness is that perfection whereby God abhors sin and demands purity. So now let's look at how the Trinity, the triunity of God, is holy. Number one, God the Father is holy. The Bible says in Isaiah 41 verse 14, Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who, re who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So God is the Holy One of Israel. And then number two, not only is God the Father holy, but God the Son is holy. According to Acts 3, verse 14, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter and the eleven got up and spoke to the multitude of Jews, they said, But you denied the Holy and Righteous One, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. So here in the context, he's obviously speaking about Jesus, because he was the Holy and Righteous Person who was substituted for a murderer. So not only is God the Father holy, holy, God the Son is holy, but number three, God the Spirit is holy. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, Paul says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. One of the very attributes of the Holy Spirit is that adjective holy that is always put in front of Spirit. That ascribes this attribute to Him. He is the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So, letter C. What is the conclusion from God's holiness? Well, there are two aspects of God's holiness that we can find from studying the Word of God. Number one is that there is a chasm or divide between God and the sinner. Because God is holy and we are not, there is a great divide between us. In fact, Isaiah in 59 verses 1 and 2 says that our sins just keep multiplying. So because our sins just keep multiplying, we can never bridge that gap between us and God on our own. And because of that, number two, man must approach God through the merits of another if he is to approach him at all. And according to the New Testament, specifically if you look at Romans 5 and Hebrews 4, Romans declares that justification with God only comes through Jesus Christ because Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, is our great intercessor as high priest. And now that we've discussed the holiness of God, let's move on to the second communicable attribute of God, righteousness. Now the definition of righteousness, letter A, is that perfection whereby God always does right. In Genesis 18, the example I give you here is a conversation between God and Abraham about destroying Sodom. In this conversation, it is stated that God is the judge that will always do what is right. You can trust him because he will never allow circumstances to sway him one way or the other. He will never allow politics to sway him one way or the other. He always does that which is right. And in his righteousness, we have his love for holiness his demand for conformity, and the guarantee that the faithful believer will be rewarded. So let's look at some of those guarantees from righteousness. Letter B. The very first guarantee of God's righteousness is forgiveness. A very well-known verse, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. The King James translates faithful and just, but if you look at the Greek word there translated, it's actually better translated as faithful and righteous. So not only does God's righteousness guarantee forgiveness, but number two, His righteousness assures us that God will keep His promises. In Joshua 21, Joshua is dressing the people and states, that not one word that God promised Moses failed, so they could trust that God's word to them will never fail. And an application to us, if God's word has never failed anyone in the Old Testament or the New Testament, then you and I have the assurance that his word will never fail us. He will always keep his promises. And then number three,
And the fourth and final guarantee that righteousness provides us that we'll talk about in this lecture is that the righteous will be rewarded. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, Paul specifically mentions the crown of righteousness that will be given to him one day in heaven and will also be given to all of us who are believers. Now this is just one of many crowns that are promised to believers for various works that we do on earth. But there is a promise all throughout the New Testament that you and I will be rewarded for the righteous things that we do for the Lord. So now that we've talked about holiness and righteousness, the third communicable moral attribute of God that we'll discuss in, the, in this lecture is justice. What is justice? Justice is that perfection of God whereby he does not tolerate sin. Now, when it comes to justice, there are two different types or distinctions of justice when it comes to everyday life and when it comes to God. The first is called remunerative justice. Now remunerative justice is that which is manifested in a distribution of rewards. Now we've already talked about 2 Timothy 4 8 and the crown of righteousness that will be given to believers and there are already said there are many other rewards that will be given. Remunerative justice is us getting a reward for something we've done kind of like a paycheck or a trophy or whatever you want to put in there. In this context, it was a crown, and it wasn't a diadem crown, a crown that a royal person would wear. This was a crown of an athlete that an athlete would have gotten in the Olympics back in Paul's time for winning some event. You and I are promised remunerative justice for living for Christ and doing works for him. So there's remunerative justice, and number two, there is retributive justice, which is also punitive. This relates to the infliction of penalties. This is a type of justice we don't like, but it is a type of justice that is all throughout the Bible. Now, the conclusion of this is that the Bible stresses the rewards of the righteous more than the punishment of the wicked, but the latter is sufficiently prominent. So what that means is the Bible does spend far more time talking about the rewards for righteous living than it does for the punishment of wicked people. But there is still going to be a punishment for wicked people. That just means for us, our focus should be more upon the remunerative justice of living for Christ so we can get rewards to lay back at his feet one day in the future. And then number four, is love. The fourth moral or communicable attribute of God is love. So we've gone through righteousness, holiness, justice, and now we're talking about love. So letter A, love is that perfection of God whereby he is moved to communicate himself. Now if you look at these various passages in 1 John 4, the Bible declares that God is love. And because God is love, we should love each other. Then Matthew 5 says that if we love our enemies, that is being like God as his children. And then, of course, we all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Some things about God's love that we can focus on is letter B, the Father loves the Son. In John 5.20 it says, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that himself does. And... He will show him greater works than these. So the father loves the son, but not only does the father love the son, the letter C, the father loves the Christian. In John 16, 27, it says, for the father himself loves you. This is Jesus speaking to the, the disciples. Because you have loved me and have come to believe that I came from God. So God loves us because we love Jesus. This is very similar to the relationship a good father would have with his son. If a father has a good relationship with their son, then it's natural for the son's friends, those who love the father's son, for the father to love as well. So not only does the father love the son, the father loves the Christian, but lastly, the father loves the sinner. 
And John 3.16, very famous verse, we just quoted, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, without getting into a great debate or going too far out of off the topic here, that word world there in the Gospel of John is used concerning the unsaved individuals. There is nothing contextually here to make that word world mean just the world of the elect. The context of John's gospel shows that that would not fit in there. The only reason why people try to force it is a theological presupposition they have that supports translating world as world of the elect. So now that we've finished the section on the attributes of God, and we've talked about the communicable and incommunicable attributes of God, the divine and moral, now let's move on to the names of God. In the most general sense of the word, the names of God are His self-revelation. Each name will reveal to us a little about our Father, the Creator of the universe. Let's start by examining the names of God in the Old Testament. Number one, the most common used name for God in the Old Testament is El or Elohim. Now, El is just the singular version of the word God. Elohim is in the plural. Anytime you see the im ending in the Hebrew, that is like the English S. So Elohim. El is singular. Elohim is plural. Now, when it's used in reference to God, this is talking about the triunity of God, the three in one, the Elohim, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And the reason why we see that plural unity is because when referencing God in the Old Testament, Elohim is used in the plural, the verb that goes next to it is in the singular, showing that it's a plural unity. Now, the word El or Elohim means the strong and mighty one. And this is used all throughout the Old Testament. Now let's look at some of the variations of El that are used in the Old Testament that give us even more of a glimpse into the character of God. The first one we'll look at is El Elyon. El Elyon means the Most High God. Now this is not the Most High God in a sense of comparison since no other gods exist, but as an absolute. This stresses God's sovereignty and supremacy. The next one is El Shaddai. El Shaddai means the Almighty God. And of course, this one to stress the greatness of God. And then the third and final El name for God is El Olam. And El Olam means the everlasting God. And this obviously stresses that he always has been and always will be. The second name that is used of God in the Old Testament that we'll focus on is Yahweh. Now, this word here is called the Tetragrammaton. And technically, in the Hebrew, if you were to read this phonetically, it would be Yahweh. The W there is actually the Hebrew V sound. Um, an example of this is the name David. It's the same letter of the V there. It's not Dawid. It's David. So it's Yahweh. This is a tetragrammaton. And tetragrammaton means literally tetra four. Four letter word for God. And it means to exist or to be. In Exodus chapter 3, when Moses meets with God in the burning bush, he asks him, who will I say sent me? And God says, tell them that Yahweh sent you. Tell them I am that I am has sent you. Now when it comes to the names of Yahweh, they are a number of them used in the Old Testament to give us and reveal some of the character of God. So let's look at a few of those today in this lecture. The first one, letter A, is Yahweh Jireh. Now, if you see here up on the screen, it says Jehovah Jireh. One thing to point out is that the name Jehovah is not actually a word. That, that is a word that was made up by the Hebrews many years ago because they did not want to accidentally take the name of the Lord in vain, you know, break the third commandment by saying his name incorrectly or wrongly in the wrong context. 
So what they did was they took the consonants Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, put it with the vowels of Adonah, and you get Yahovah. That is how we got the word Jehovah. So you will see on my screen many times it'll just be Jehovah and then the word, but it's Yahweh Yaira. Okay, this means the Lord will provide. And in the context here of Genesis 22, this is speaking of Abraham about to offer Isaac, saying the Lord will provide a sacrifice. And then letter B, Yahweh Nisi. This one means the Lord is my banner. In this context here, Moses had just sent Joshua into battle against the Amalekites. And here he notices that when his hands are raised in the air, his people prevail. When they start lowering, they do not. Now there was a special power in the faith of lifting your hands that we see in the Old Testament with Moses by parting the Red Sea and many other things. So Moses does this as a way to gain the victory over the Amalekites. And because of it, he names the place or he says that Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Now, if you see here on the screen, this is a nice little banner here. The Lord is my banner. When we're speaking of banner in the Old Testament, specifically with Exodus 17, we're talking about a militaristic sign that was taken into battle. Moses saying here, the Lord is their militaristic sign to take into battle. And then letter C, Yahweh Shalom. Shalom is a very common Hebrew word. Many people know what this means. It means peace. The Lord is peace. In the book of Judges, there was a constant sin cycle of the people living for God, falling away from God, being um, oppressed because of their sin, them praying for deliverer, God sending a judge, and delivering them from the enemy. If they were to see peace, it came from God and it came from living a righteous life. The Lord is our peace. Then letter D, Yahweh Sabaoth. Yahweh Sabaoth is the Lord of hosts. And the hosts, the military, what that word means, of God is literally the angels. Then letter E, the last one for today, Yahweh Makedeshkum. Very fun word to say, Yahweh Makedeshkum, means the Lord, your sanctifier. The Lord, the one who sanctifies us, cleanses us, sets us apart, holy for him, and consecrates us for the Lord's work and for our life. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 17 for BIB 201. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.